Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Beth Nguyen, Academic Director, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our reading series tonight featuring Sam Lipside. Before we begin, I'm going to remind you to silence your devices. The alcohol will be back after <laughs> the reading concludes. And several people and entities to thank. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone in the MFA program for all of your work. The Department of English, the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you to Micah Ballard. He's always in the back. Thank you to our new program assistant, David Garcia. And thank you, Hannah Bendixson, who's selling books in the back. Oh, yes, thank you, who's selling books courtesy of Green Apple Books. Thank you, Green Apple, for supporting our program. It's a good one. So tonight, I am get to introduce our introducer, <laughs> who is always the wonderful, vibrant, exciting Susan Steinberg. Hi. I only see five of my students here, so make eye contact. Oh, I saw you guys already. The others. Um, all right, thanks for coming. Uh, so Dave Madden asked me if I wanted to introduce Sam Lipsight, and I said I did. Um, but I actually thought that Dave Madden should introduce Sam because he's so good at introductions. And I'm sure you've heard them, and I'm not. So when Dave Madden writes an introduction, he tends to focus on the professional aspects of the writer and the writing. He rereads the books, or it seems like he does anyway. He reads the reviews, and he pulls out smart quotes from both. In other words, he takes some responsibility for this. Whereas when I write an introduction, I tend to, <laughs> I tend to tell personal anecdotes about the writer that likely make both the writer and the audience feel awkward. So my instinct standing up here is to tell you how I first met Sam at a festival in Austin, how we barely spoke to one another, how completely intimidated I was by him, um, and whatever other embarrassing details I can remember about that week. And my instinct is to tell you how we met again in Vermont later, years later, and somehow became friends, and all of those embarrassing details too. But instead, I'm going to take the professional route, because I'm doing it for Dave Madden, and tell you what people are saying about Sam's books. I'll start by saying that when my last book came out, I read the reviews, and some I trusted, and some I didn't. But there was one review that stuck with me the most, and I've shared it with a lot of people, in including my students. It was written by Megan on Goodreads. <laughs> and <laughs> she gave my book three stars, and her review said simply, Daddy Issues. <laughs> I was like, Finally, someone really gets me. <laughs> no review after could compare. So of course I turned to Goodreads for the brutal honesty I needed for this introduction. I read through literally, literally thousands <laughs> of reviews of Sam's work and I've narrowed it down to these. Greg says, <laughs> the ask is a weird novel to find yourself really enjoying. It's like getting punched in the face and laughing about it. <laughs> Chris says, I loved Lipsight's book, Homeland. It was so damn funny and demented and grouchy and sophisticatedly pissy. I underlined the hell out of it, wrote little notes in the margins about my wish to hang out with my secret literary crush, Sam Lipsight. <laughs> Jim says, there are two kinds of readers in this country. Those who know that Sam Lipsight is the fun... Those are my other glasses. Those who know that Sam Lipsight is the funniest writer of his generation and those who haven't read him yet. Brandy says, fucking fantastic. <laughs> Roger says, vulgar, insane, drugs, hilarious. <laughs> Daniel says, I'm still reading this. It should be a quick read, but I've already left it once at the airport security stand. 
Richie recommended it, and he's from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny says, the world of men is strange and scary. It's hard to imagine I'm the same species as the narrator. <laughs> Justin says, damn, Sam Lipside is good. He's like a, a scrappy Nabokov rooting through the gutters of the 21st century. That's probably a shitty description of the guy, but I can't do better. The book is good, too. It's very funny. <laughs> It's very funny and gnarly and real. It's Zen-like in its disgruntlement. Adrian says, reading this book is exactly like doing mushrooms. <laughs> Amanda says, my gynecologist saw me reading this and asked if it was funny. Sure, I said. Good, she said. I need something to make me laugh after the long hours at this job. <laughs> uh, I said, this book isn't that, but it's great. <laughs> And Michael says, I feel much angrier now. Thanks. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to welcome Sam Lipsay. All that time I spent on Goodreads writing reviews of my own work really, <laughs> really paid off, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Susan, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you guys for coming, for having me here. Uh, it's Randy, was that the one who said, uh, fucking fantastic, yeah. Uh, anyway, I uh, am delighted to be here. I just had a great time talking with, a, with some of you in a class, and uh, I'm just gonna read from some new work. And uh, this is from a f novel that I guess maybe will be out in about a year. I'm just finishing it, so it's, uh, it's a sneak peek, I guess. Uh, it's called Hark. I'm just gonna read a few selections from, that I've sort of culled from the first 50 pages, and I don't know if it'll make that much narrative sense, but you'll get a, you'll get a feeling for what it is. It's fucking fantastic. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Listen, before Hark, was it ever harder to be human? Was it ever harder to believe in our world? The weather made us wonder. The markets had, the wars. The rich had stopped pretending they were just the best of us and not some utterly different form of life. The rest, the most, could glimpse their end on earth in the parched basins and roiling seas, but could not march against their masters. They slaughtered each other instead, retracted into glowing holes. Hark glowed too. He came to us and was goldeny. It wasn't that Hark had the answer, it was more that he didn't. All he possessed, he claimed, were a few tricks or tips to help people focus at work, at home, out for coffee with a client or a friend. Listen, before Hark, was it ever harder to find focus? Hark gathered his tips together, called it mental archery. Pretty silly, he liked to say, but some knew better. Some were certain he had a secret, a mystery, a miracle. For what was mental archery but the essence of Hark? And what was the essence of Hark but love? In this hurt world, how could that hurt? The hunters of meaning had found no meaning. The wanters of dreams were dreamless. Many now drifted toward Hark Mourner. This is like the backstory. The front story is about a bunch of people and a movement they launched under the banner of Hark, a movement that maybe meant nothing at all, or maybe it did. It's tough to tell. The past is tricky, often half hidden, like a pale, flabby young man flung naked into a crowded square. The past doesn't stand there, Grant Ganders. The past clasps its crotch, scurries for the cover of stanchions, benches. History hides, that's its job. It hides behind other history. Fraz Penzig, one of the front story people, knows all about it. He used to teach some history, 
though he hasn't taught it in a while, not since the middle school cut staff by a third. His wife, Tova, told him that life is not a zero-sum game, but Fraz senses that if it were, he would be the zero-sum. Lucky for him that Tova is still employed. He's grateful for the medical, though he happens to have his health at the moment. Not that it's something you can ever truly own or bequeath like a house or a houseboat or a parcel of land in the hills, but Fraz does have his health. Oh, maybe he feels frail on occasion, a tad pulped, bones shot, frequently fevered, on the verge of the verge of death, but make no mistake, he's hardy. His twinges, his spasms, his stabby aches, they're chronic, like all the other minor hurts, the gym injuries, the sprains achieved mysteriously on the can. He's terminal, but not quite near the terminus. Like when he had that raisin on his head, went to the raisin doctor. It's nothing, the raisin doctor said. Nothing? I mean, it's something. It's just what people get on the way down. You want I laser the fucker off? Also, 46 years on this hard turd of a world, and Fraz's mind is still, by his lights, pure silk. He knows younger types already fried or brined, not just with drugs or booze, but merely from rising in the morning, moving about in their private biospheres of panic and decay, the hours at work, the hours of work at home, the hours of work with spouses, fathers, mothers, children, the stresses laced into the simplest tasks, the fight or flight responses to kitchen appliances, not to mention the mighty common domes with which the individual bubbles ven, the fouled sky, the polluted food, the pharma-fed rivers full of sad-eyed oxytrout, the genes on outlet shelves and their modalities of size, skinny fit, classic fit, fat shepherd fit, all died a deep cancer blue, and the wave rot, of course, the pixel-assisted suicide, the screens, the screens, the screens. Yes, Fraz is lucky, privileged if you please, not just to be alive, but to live here, his locus, his home grove, the city that never sleeps, but paces its garret in a nervous rage, the city of his kin. Once he had some vague ambitions, semi-valuable skills, now he tutors school kids part-time, does favors for an old friend of his late father. He's also lucky Tova's affections don't hinge on his ability to generate revenue, or maybe her, affection, her affections hinge on nothing now. But fie on such wallow world musings, fie on these flurries of own negs. Today he will shrug off the cape of self-hate. Fraz has upsides, he's a doting father. He's one of Hark's apostles. He spreads the word. Also, he's rich in nutrients, solid from the gym, with, despite a certain overspreading doughiness, some noteworthy detail on his tries and delts. Truth is, he'd rather be a male waif, but he got Jude, he can say it, on the genetics. <laughs> his narrow band of endomorphic choice will always come down to this, lard barn, or semi-cut chunk. Today he's headed downtown for a meeting with the Mental Archery Brain Trust, Kate Rumpler, the young heiress who funds their institute, Teal Baker Cassini, the, discipline, the discipline's leading intellectual light, and Hark Mourner himself, their radiant, inscrutable guru. They will take their booth at the Chakra Khan, sip kale and peppermint toddies. They have much to discuss demonstration videos, scheduled appearances, the true arrow, a new feed on Hark Hub. Fraz wishes they could meet at a coffee bar or a full service bar or a full service meat cart. <laughs> he likes the street meat, the tangy skewers. He doesn't mind the toddies, but the candles, the garden scents menace his dainty machismo. Listen, such are the sacrifices one makes for the cause for mental archery, for love. Today, Hark and Fraz ride north toward some bluffs above the Hudson. Pickering, New York, once the largest manufacturer of frozen waffles in the country, has invited Hark to speak on the rudiments of mental archery. Near the town, an ancient billboard juts from a cliff. 
Boys in earth tone plastic helmets clutch honey browned, frost stippled discs. The tagline reads, Gentlemen, start your toasters. Fraz recalls this ad campaign from his childhood, though he remembers it as, Gentlemen, start your waffles. Could the company have survived longer with his version? Fraz berates himself for foolish speculation, then berates his inner berater for stifling winsome or playful thoughts. For from such lazy perambulations through the noggin's grottos, profundity can effloresce. Ideations, now he's thinking too much. Clumps of overthought thoughts accrue, cloud him. Fraz switches to a vacant setting, watches the roadside world slide by. Fields, houses, malls, rivers, malls. In mental archery, this is called unstringing your bow. Hark unstrings his bow a lot, falls into silence, self. Fraz turns from the window to study Hark, the soft electrics of those gold-flecked green eyes, the ninja sinews in his neck, the spiky, creamy meringue of his hair. Sometimes Hark appears born of a fabled tribe from a fold in space. Today he's a young man on a bus. He hunches, scribbles in a battered yellow journal. When Hark does speak, his voice is an enchanted river with roars and hushes and thick crystal swerves. It carves a course for Fraz to follow, to flow toward, out from his fetid backwaters, his brack stink. Fraz met Hark by chance in a bookstore. He ducked in out of the summer heat to kill time before a tutoring gig. The streets were a hot, greasy griddle, and Fraz was bent on the assassination of a tiny segment of time. Also, he wanted a book. He was depressed about the political situation, and he wanted a book that was either about the political situation or not about the political situation at all. <laughs> this book would either explain with unerring exactitude the intractable shittiness of the political situation, or it would transport him to another place, a magical forest of shittinesslessness, for example, <laughs> or perhaps transport him to another time, a time that did not flinch in the face of Fraz's determination to kill it. Yes, he was depressed. Or was he just sensitive? Maybe his was the reasonable response to the situations, the political situation, the economic situation, the situations at home with Tova and the kids, or to bring it into Harkian focus a bit more, the Tova situation, what was actually probably literally known to Tova as the Fraz situation. One had to see his perspective on these things. He could sense Tova's displeasure, her weariness. The qualities in Fraz she once claimed to adore were maybe, maybe not such adorable qualities anymore. He wanted a book to tell him what to do about all these situations. He knew there were books like this, though he'd never read them. But he didn't see any books in the bookstore. He saw a man instead and a dozen other people in metal chairs. A hand-lettered sign on the table read, Mental Archery with Hark Mourner. A pile of stapled pamphlets lay beside it. Fraz took a seat as Hark spoke in his freshwater voice, riverine and delicious, about the force of an imaginary arrow. And Fraz, a fellow who really hadn't been able to focus on anything for too long, not for years, not since preparing history quizzes for his pupils, who led the Swedish intervention in the Thirty Years' War, when considering the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire, how would one define a shirtwaist? began to focus. The situations, the perspectives, they retreated from what he was often hesitant to call his mind. If this was not the answer, perhaps it was the path to one. What had Hark said that made all the difference? Hark said boy, Hark said space, Hark said apple, Hark said time. Someday soon you too will understand. Tova's on the train with the twins. She sits between them, keeps them yoked in relatively loose pro-wrestler chokeholds. <laughs> they are temporarily immobilized and thus unable to assault each other or, less likely, fellow riders, both of which with these maniacs are possibilities, especially this morning. Meanwhile, she texts emendations to her supervisor's proposal to the provisional deputy head of development at the Blended Learning Enhancement Project 
who her supervisor, Cal, possesses what Tova knows the business community deems leadership qualities, meaning he's equal parts lout and fool, a human facsimile on a ceaseless quest to collect his salary and cover his butt. Apropos of which, the reason she's here on the subway restraining her kids in semi-legal grappler grips instead of already at her desk is because one or both of her children have, as she put it as concisely as she could on the phone to the doctor, concerns of the ass. <laughs> More specifically, ass worms. <laughs> Tova may have ass worms too. What happened was that all of their assholes started to itch and Tova, look, and Tova looked this symptom up, discovered a detailed photograph of a hairy, nearly microscopic worm. Somebody had earned enough trust from this creature to achieve a lively, candid shot. As, <laughs> as the critter regarded the camera with unamused scorn. <laughs> Mostly expressed through what Tova supposed were eyes, but on further inspection might have been anal orifices themselves. <laughs> Tova tried to call Fraz, but hasn't been able to reach him. He could be tutoring or doing a favor for Mr. Dirsch or more, most likely cleaning and jerking, perhaps at the gym, more likely at home. The <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The twins' noses nearly touch and Tova's double clinch. Jesus, Mom, stop, let me go, David says. Seriously, Lisa says. Hush it, guys. The names of her children sometimes embarrass Tova. They were Fraz's idea. He had declared himself the creative one, which is how people, men, describe themselves when they aren't the competent ones. <laughs> Tova has a degree in poetry and two chapbooks, even if that was a thousand lives ago, but somehow he bulldozed her on the kids' names. Fraz fretted, as he explained at the time, that what you called your children made your aesthetic too visible. You had to be clever. You could give them names culled from your particular ethnic tradition, or the names of major martyrs, or storied boroughs, neighborhoods. Tremont and Sunnyside were possibilities. You could also bestow family monikers. Tova wanted to call the boy Jonah after her uncle and the girl Sarah, but Fraz insisted there was another familial tradition to uphold. His father, Frank Penzig, had named his son after an incident in which he misheard a page at the airport. He could have sworn the woman was saying, Fraz Penzig, please come to gate number five. Fraz's father had been bold and imaginative enough, Fraz told Tova, to remember that moment in the Pan Am departure lounge and celebrate its uncanniness by naming his only child Fraz. But what was uncanny about it? Frank had just misheard an airport announcement. What was uncanny about being a half-deaf doof? <laughs> Meanwhile, Fraz decided to honor his father by rebuke, bless his twins with top picks from Fraz's birth year, the kinds of names he would most likely have received if sired by a less inspired or perhaps less impairing impaired man. Penzig men, always hovering just outside of an inside joke they have played on themselves. <laughs> Tova loosens her choke grips, the twins flop back in their seats, rub their necks, groan. They peer about the subway car for pitying looks, or perhaps an undercover agent from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Bitch Fuck Moms to bust their mother for abuse. But the other riders, ingrates, ignore them. Grown-ups are sick, thinks Lisa, and maybe David does too, since their eight-year-old twin minds beam thoughts and emotions back and forth, or at least that's what it feels like or what people tell them it's supposed to feel like. Tova asks her children if their assholes still itch. Not as much, says David. Lisa nods, reaches out for a nasty flick of her brother's earlobe. Both of you stop it, says Tova. Her itch is faint at best. Could it be that new cheap detergent Fraz bought, so proud of his thrift? She never did see a worm except in the photograph, but it looked so real and wanting to nestle in the rectums of her family. Did she overreact? How can an overworked working mother overreact? The intestinal canals of your precious spawn teem with maggots. Your husband slacks off on a job that barely keeps him in breath mints, and your dolt of a supervisor gets promoted based on your due diligence. Overreaction is an impossibility. Maybe the doctor will have some cold, soothing cream 
a nice cooling ointment in her butt could absolve this galling day, so long as Fraz doesn't figure it for a goddamn invitation. Okay. In the beginning, Hark just wanted to jest. He took improv classes, hovered near open mics. He'd never been the class cut up or craved attention or made anybody laugh, not even his family, certainly not his father. But one day, Hark told Fraz he decided to try comedy. There was something awkward, almost insensate about his stage persona, but for some reason it worked. Hark strained gestures toward even the easiest or most cliched modes of stand-up somehow refreshed them. His struggle, it seemed to the audience, was not with idiom but intent. He told jokes as though they were some alien and deathless gospel and dire fates awaited those who did not take heed. This made his routines funnier. A woman at one of the clubs told him there were other Spectrum comics, but he was the real McCoy. What Spectrum, Hark said but the lady only laughed, stroked his cheek. Whatever she meant, Hark never bombed. One night, a booker noticed this and gave him slots at a new club in the valley. Hark did five minutes on the pitfalls of office life, even he knew was stale, but the bit gave the booker an idea about how to use Hark for a different kind of gig. For a semi-ample fee, Hark would attend a corporate gathering, a shareholders meeting or sales conference or tropical team retreat. The bosses would bill him as an expert in some esoteric practice, knife yoga, reverse hypnosis. Mental archery was an early favorite. He cooked up after he found a toy bow stuck out of a curbside garbage can. Hark's program, the CEO would announce, had quantifiable bearing on the health and productivity of the company. Now would come a pall, interrupted only by the thrums and adagios of unsilenced phones, the rustle of pressed shorts. Nobody wanted to hear another expert's speech. They'd already attended their morning workshops, their mind swap sessions. Folks hankered for a dip in the hotel pool, lunch, a nap, a cocktail, a secret suck around with Evan from design. Now they'd have to sit through another lecture about stress avoidance by some boring shit in a drab shirt. <laughs> Hark would play the part, upbeat if vague, apt to toss counterintuitive morsels to the crowd. Did you know that archers are among the fittest athletes in the world? That the bow and arrow has killed more people in history than firearms and fed more people than any industrial or technological advance in food production since terraced farming? Or that people who take up mental archery actually gain IQ points and lower their bad cholesterol? And that one needn't leave one's living room or own archery equipment to achieve this? The audience would take them for a second raider, some ideas festival journeyman, part jack-off, part data spurt, or was that one thing? But a shift would begin. Nobody would notice at first, too distanced by the promise of a mahi-mahi club with sweet potato fries or some jacuzzi nookie. Hark would shepherd the sermon weirdward, weirdward, the measured language fracturing, his docile flock of reasonable tips for better corporate living driven off the best practices cliff, the crowd and horrified witness. You are the arrow, Hark would shout, but you are also what it pierces. You are the machine and the poor child ground to chuck in its cogs. Flail skyward and hear your demon rulers cackle. Poor fools, you will never break out of your salary frames. But before things got too sacrilegious, somebody, the CEO, the CTO, the CFO, the CSO, the CCO, a serious suit, a senior dragon, would leap to the lectern, escort Hark out to the hoots of the employees, the family, the claims division clan. I don't know what the hell that was, a vice enchilada might shout. Schmuck lost his marbles. Anyway, you don't need some loser to yammer on about stress and productivity. You're the most productive fucking stress cases in the country. You win. Mahi mahi on me. Hand thunder. That's what Hark's old booker called applause. The hand thunder would roll in. The suits might not inform their people that Hark was a ringer until the postprandial toasts, or ever. Not that Hark cared. 
He snatched the check as soon as he got off stage, dove into the airport shuttle like a contract commando, fleeing a failed coup. Thing was, Hark wasn't the only person who worked this niche. A guy named Cornelius the corporate imposter had the gig before Hark. Big Lev from Biz Dev had sewn up Silicon Valley. But they were too broad. Nobody bought their acts after a line or two. Hark twitched with the plausible, which in the end was no surprise. For Hark had begun to believe his words. Not everything, of course, but he saw the potential for an authentic appeal. He began to write the aphorisms, draw up the poses. He built a small brass pedestal for the cheap blue bow. The joke drained away, and Hark retired his jester's bells. His craven prance shed his fool's skin, slithered out, translucent, sincere. The world was as funny as starlight or the corpse of a child, and the pay would be crap, but he now knew his calling. He had no particular message to deliver, just an array of useful practices, but he could still be a humble messenger, or maybe, as he'd begun to feel a new strange potency, a not-so-humble messenger. It was a confusing feeling, almost like another puberty, but without the suicidal ideation and sheet acne. He felt himself drawn past the human threshold into a fresher realm, an immense and shimmering kingdom he could not yet countenance. For now, home or office would suffice. Let me read a little bit more. Oh, this is a, a little another little bit with uh, our friend Fraz. thinking about how he wanted to make movies, but never, never did. This morning, in the shower, attempting to jet wash his anus from a frisk position against the tiles, <laughs> Fraz had an epiphany. He knows epiphanies are passe, but this one overcame categorical obsolescence. Triptych, women and sadness. Fraz will make a film in three sections, each about a woman who is beautiful and sad, and how the principles of mental archery might free her. His mother will be the first panel, Tova the second. The film will employ a rigorous neo-emo sensibility. <laughs> warts and all, but also, in parts, wartless. What is beauty? Is it truth or just random molecularity? Is beauty in the eye of the beholder? Does it crush the beholder's eyeballs? <laughs> the souls of the beheld? Plus, what is sadness? Plus, what are women? <laughs> he will take on the tough questions. Maybe he will learn something about his subjects or himself. Maybe he will learn how to talk to Tova again. He's been working on that, they both have, in their counseling sessions with Teal. This was Hark's idea. After Fraz mentioned that he had a Tova situation and that Tova had a Fraz situation, Hark suggested they embark on some couples therapy with Teal, who had not completed the clinical qualifications for her social work degree, but whose life wisdom and experience with mental archery might compensate. Tova scoffed but agreed to one session, after which she was converted. Here was a person, she told Fraz, who could comprehend Tova's pain with proper nuance. Teal was brilliant, like Tova, and had done time, which Tova sometimes felt she was doing with Fraz. <laughs> Fraz recalls an exchange from a recent session. Tova, I just feel this distance. Like when Fraz makes a joke, I know even before he's finished that I won't find it funny. <laughs> Whereas I used to laugh at all his jokes. We laugh so much together. Now, even if we're watching a comic on TV, like an intelligent, funny one, if Fraz laughs, I just shut down. Get distant, icy. It's me, really. Teal, what do you mean, you? Tova, when I'm not happy, I disassociate. I'm somewhere else for a while. Fraz, it's true. It's like she's on another planet. A glaze comes over her face. It's like she's teleported out of her body, left it there to operate on autopilot. Teal, where are you, Tova? Where do you go? Tova, I don't really know. It's a brightly lit place well scrubbed, kind of rustic, a farmhouse. There's a man there. He's tall and lean with a beard. We're together and we're safe. Fraz, sounds like your father. 
I don't know where the farmhouse comes from. Tova, I like farmhouses. Teal, is this man your lover? Tova, I don't think so. It's just that we keep each other safe. Teal, do you have lovers in this rustic place, this safe farmhouse setting? Tova, I'm satisfied. It's like the whole deal, the farmhouse, the field, the trees. They are my lovers. Fraz, she'd rather fuck the scenery than me. <laughs> Teal, accept it. Fraz. Fraz, what? Teal, or fight for her. Fraz, fight her rural fantasia? <laughs> Teal, you want her back on your ding-dong? Fraz, yes. <laughs> Teal, then string your goddamn bow and declare war on her dumb fuck bourgeois fantasia. Tova, you have to destroy my fantasia, Fraz. <laughs> Fraz, is this what couples therapy is normally like? <laughs> Teal, I don't know, I just started. <laughs> now Fraz takes another pull of ale from his pewter cup. The others were heartbroken when the Chakra Khan went out of business, and this upscale lipids and gristle joint opened in its stead. But Fraz rejoiced. It's not like you can't get green juice in this town. And this place, with its faux colonial decor and oak plank piss troughs, is just more conducive to the kind of manly Promethean thoughts Fraz wishes to think more. Legend, Hark says. Legend tells us an Austrian reeve named Gessler erected a pole in the village of Altdorf. Upon the pole, he hung his cap and ordered all who passed to honor it with a reverent bow. One day, celebrated Alpine activist William Tell arrived with his son and made it a public point to ignore the command. Gessler was incensed. He arrested the Tells and sentenced both man and boy to death with the now notorious caveat. If Tell could split an apple set atop his son's head, they'd both go free. Tell was a crossbow specialist, but he must still be counted as one of the great archers in history. He fired a bolt and halved the apple. What was his son thinking in this moment? What dire sensation danced along his scalp? We will never know. When Gessler saw those apple halves tumble to the soon-to-be Swiss national grass, he knew he had to keep his promise, spare the Tells. But he noticed that Tell had drawn two bolts from his belt. Why too, asked the brutal, sly, vain, paranoid, though this is all speculative, Gessler. If I'd missed, Tell said, and killed my son, the second bolt was for you. Whereupon Tell was clapped in irons and sentenced to death, this time with no chance for clemency. The manner of execution decreed is worth noting. Gessler announced that Tell was to be bound and gagged with an apple, bound with a rope, that is, and gagged with an apple. The archer who could skewer the fruit, as Gessler may or may not have phrased it in his diabolical speaking voice, which according to no document bore the nasty cadences of an old-fashioned, stereotypically English Hollywood movie villain, would claim 10 gold ingots, or the equivalent in grain. Before the order could be carried out, however, Tell played a now familiar, but then novel trick on the jail guard. He feigned a brain tumor, and as the guard approached to assess the aggressiveness of the cancer and suggest a course for treatment, Tell snatched him by the collar and banged his skull against the bars. Plucking a key from the unconscious guard's belt, Tell flung open his cell door and fled into a brisk and stunning whitescape. Gessler and his Euro posse made lively pursuit, and when they rounded the last bend on the mountain switchback, the villain spotted Tell. Surrender yourself, he exhorted. But almost instantly, the founding hero of Swiss Confederation fired a bolt into Gessler's cloudy blue eye. This single shot launched a revolution that would birth a nation dedicated to mountain sports and banking. <laughs> what happened to William Tell's son, you might ask? I have no idea. Obviously, he didn't live up to his old man's legacy, but who could? 
Perhaps if William Tell's son had been a modern Swiss tennis legend and endorser of quality wristwatches, he could have achieved filial parity. But I doubt it. It's difficult to be a son. Daughterhood is harder still. But I digress. You see, I understand as much as anybody that we're in a business school right now, and you shining newbies want to know but one thing. What is the relationship between successful entrepreneurship and mental archery? Well, let me ask you this. When William Tell sighted down his crossbow in that terrible moment, what do you think he thought? Maybe he thought, please, God, let me hit the fucking apple. But perhaps he thought instead, please, God, don't let me hit the boy. He was good enough that it would be one or the other. He was never in danger of missing both. But which thought, do you suppose, thrummed more fiercely along the tautened bowstring of his mind? Close your eyes, friends. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Now let it go. Keep your eyes closed. Keep breathing. Let everything fall away. No thoughts. That's it. Keep breathing. Okay. Apple, yes. Boy, no. That's it. Breathe. Feel your heart slow. Feel it nearly cease to beat. Apple, yes. Boy, no. Your heart is slowing, easing, maybe, to a lovely standstill. There is so much time between each beat. There is so much space between each beat. So much time, so much space. So much time, apple, time, space, boy, apple, time, space, boy, apple, time, space, boy, time, space, 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 boy. Thank you.